Hi, my name is Sarah Demers, and I am an associate professor in the physics department here at Yale, and I'm really happy to spend a few minutes talking to you about my work with undergraduates, my teaching, and my research. So I'm going to dive right into some of the recent teaching that I've been doing. When I think back to my interview when I first came and was looking for, for uh, faculty positions, at Yale, a comment was made that we really care about teaching here. And to be honest, I was a little bit skeptical in the beginning. That's a comment you hear quite a bit. But I've been really thrilled to find that there is an emphasis on teaching here, and I've had a community of people to work with, to become a better teacher, to talk to, and any crazy idea you have about a class seems to get some momentum behind it because the Yale undergraduates are so much fun to work with. So just a couple of classes that I've taught in the last five years. One, physics of dance. Um, that I'll combine with physics of music when I talk about it. Something that is exciting about doing STEM at Yale is the really strong humanities and arts that we're surrounded by. And it's been great to be able to have partnerships with people. I've co-taught these courses, uh, and the students have come from all backgrounds. We look at things, we look at the art form through the lens of physics and also um, science through the lens of the art form. So you can imagine the kinds of things that we get to do in these courses. Physics of dance is actually taught in a dance studio, so we're moving around quite a bit. Um, physics of music, I have a, an image here where you can see an instrument that the course built in our Center for Engineering um, CEID for Innovation and Design. Each student had to make a, a, a calculation of what um, dimensions this block had to be in order to emanate a certain tone, and then we put them all together. Um, and we actually managed in March, the instrument is so large that we could play it, the, the two faculty members, in a physically distanced manner without getting anywhere near each other. It's a massive thing that you can play um, really cool songs on, so we create quite a bit. In addition to that, I have taught the introductory physics sequence. I teach that pretty often to first-year students. That's a tremendous amount of fun. Um, it's mechanics, electricity, and magnetism. Of course, we talk a little bit about special relativity, a little bit of quantum mechanics, um, just to catch people up with the last 100 years of developments in, um, in STEM in general and physics. And then also, I'm currently teaching a science and public policy course. This is a, a important course for us as scientists to be thinking about. Um, we're understanding how it is that policy is formed, both policies that are informed by science and also policies that govern how science works. Both of those things are critical for a scientist to try to understand. And then finally, one of my uh, other recent favorite classes is actually one that I volunteer teach along with four or five other faculty members every spring, and that's Being Human in STEM. It's a small group that gets together to think about different biases and, um, and challenges and just the realities that being a human has, uh, the challenges that it can be to, to be a human in any workforce. Um, and we don't acknowledge that always fully within STEM. So that's been neat. I've learned a lot from the students with that. So um, hopefully, if you come, I'll have a chance to interact with you in one of these contexts. And I have to say, they're all exciting. And it's been neat for me to go back and forth between teaching what you might call a traditional straight up physics class and then getting to physics in all of these different ways. So that's a very quick spiel on my recent teaching. Um, and I, I now want to dive into some of my research to give you a chance to um, understand a little bit of what I do in that um, realm, and also to talk about how undergraduates fit into my work. So I am a particle physicist, and as you can see from this slide, we get the very best press sometimes. We're actually one of the fields that tests the idea that there is no such thing as bad press, as you can tell. Uh, my favorite headline here is this one in the lower left that says, scientists at Large Hadron Collider hope to make contact with parallel universe in days. And there's something very ominous about that in days that I like. As a particle physicist, I work on what we call the energy frontier. We take the highest energy proton collisions, human-made proton collisions in the world, smash these particles together, and then use the basic idea that we've heard through Einstein's E equals mc squared um, equation. You have energy on one side, and you want to create matter 
Uh, and so we, we provide nature with some energy and we see what kinds of matter comes out. And we use that to try to understand what are the fundamental building blocks of the universe? So what are the, the tiniest pieces that everything else is composed of, if you can think about the universe in that way? And then how do those pieces, those fundamental blocks, interact with each other? I do this work with two of my colleagues, Professors Keith Baker and Paul Tipton uh, at Yale. We have groups on the ATLAS experiment at the Large Hadron Collider. And the focus of our recent work has been through um, understanding, first discovering, then trying to understand the Higgs boson, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a few minutes. But I first want to talk about the machinery that we use. This is not in Yale's backyard. There's only one of these things in the world. Um, there's another similar machine also at CERN. And those of us in this field uh, um, with this experiment, the ATLAS experiment, are members of a 4,000-person team. We work together from over 100 countries all across the world to try to understand what are the fundamental building blocks of nature. Something that's uh, striking, I think, about Atlas, and this is an image of the detector with most of the detector innards actually ripped out. This is just showing the um, toroidal magnets, the very outer ranges of the detector, but it gives you a sense of the scale of it. Um, it's six stories high, and it's the length of a football field. And it might seem surprising that we need something so big and complicated, we have hundreds of millions of electronic channels in the Atlas detector, to try to understand things that are so small. But the reality is we have a tremendous amount of energy that we're packing in in these proton collisions. And the particles that we create in the center of these collisions are streaming out at near the speed of light and the ones that are massless at the speed of light. So the particles are moving very fast. And if we want to characterize them, learn something about them, one of the things that we do, which maybe you have learned in a physics class, and if you haven't, I hope um, you'll learn soon, is we place these particles in magnetic fields. And the amount of the curvature inside of a magnetic field tells us something about the, the energy momentum of that particle. Okay, so uh, we need to have massive detectors and strong magnetic fields in order to do the experiments that we want to on these particles in a very brief period of time during which they're, they're flying through our machine. So this is ATLAS. Um, I have a group of a postdoc and two graduate students. And throughout my time at Yale, I've worked with a rotating team of different undergraduate students. So many at this point, I have to work harder and harder to squeeze them all onto the screen. I came to Yale in 2009 and always have a number of undergraduates in my group. And we're trying to understand the Higgs boson. The undergraduates are really a critical piece of my research program. Um, I think the best illustration of what an undergraduate brings to my group can be uh, told thinking back to the discovery of the Higgs boson in 2012. I had a couple of undergraduate students at CERN that summer, um, a number of graduate students in my postdoc. My undergraduate students, the Yale undergraduate team, I think we had nine of them over there among the, those of us who are faculty members on the experiment. They were in the very front row of open seating in the main CERN auditorium for the discovery announcement of the Higgs. My graduate students, who I love dearly and who love physics dearly, were in third overflow housing, basically, or the, you know, the third overflow room, an auditorium um, way off site. The undergraduates stayed up all night with their pillows in front of the door to try to get in um, to, to get those good seats for the Higgs discovery. So uh, it's, it's partly the excitement of the undergraduates and also partly the fact that my introduction to particle physics was as an undergraduate that I am excited and committed to always having those students in my group. So it wouldn't be a talk from me if I didn't have at least a little bit of physics in it. So we are actually going to talk about the Higgs boson and what it does in about two or three minutes um, before I tell you about my one other experiment that I'm on. And the question that I like to ask people when we start to think about the Higgs is, have you ever worried about the speed of light? Is that something that keeps you up at night? The fact that it exists is a problem for me or it's interesting for me. Um, why does it exist? What does it mean that there is a speed limit? 
So particle physicists in the 1960s knew, um, let me, okay, backing up a little bit to try to attack this as a particle physicist does, because when I think of the speed limit, I immediately think of mass. Physicists knew in the 1960s that there were two kinds of particles, particles with mass and particles without mass. So an example of a particle with mass is an electron. An example of a particle without mass would be a photon, a light particle. But we have other examples too, like the gluon, which you may or may not have heard of. Um, and a question is, so particles with mass can't get to the speed of light. It doesn't matter how much force you apply, how long you push them, how hard you push them, you cannot get those particles going at the speed of light. Um, photons, particles without mass, on the other hand, can never slow down. They have absolutely no choice, it appears. They're always traveling at the speed of light. So the question that, that physicists were asking themselves is, um, what is mass? What is it that slows particles down and keeps them from traveling at the speed of light? And it turns out that the Higgs boson is evidence for the mechanism of mass. And hopefully we'll have a chance to continue that conversation um, at some other point. The thing that we're, we're wondering now is, is this Higgs boson behaving in all of the ways that it's predicted to behave? Um, because there are things about it that don't sit well with other realities in our universe. We're concerned about its mass, which appears to be too low. So the Higgs boson itself has mass. Um, and there are a number of other mysteries that make us want to understand the Higgs and its behavior better. So that's one branch of, of research that I'm doing right now. And I'm gonna end by just telling you about the other bit of research that I'm working on. Um, and that is using another fundamental particle, the muon, to probe for physics beyond our current models. And this is a project that's done, it's a small project on particle physics standards, meaning it's only about 220 people. And I currently have three undergraduates working on this project right now. Um, Fermilab is, a, I should have said CERN is over in Switzerland, um, on the, the border between France and Switzerland. Um, Fermilab is actually outside of Chicago. Uh, so it's a little bit more local for us, only one time zone difference, which you grow to appreciate at a certain point. Fermilab is looking for the decays of muons. Muons are basically heavier copies of electrons, and this is a, a diagram of the experiment. One of the fun things about mu to e is that we're currently building it. So we're in the process of building it, then get to commission it, try to understand the data that we get from it, um, and then interpret the data. So we're gonna slam lots of muons into a target. Slam is the wrong word, because we're hoping to catch them, and then watch how they decay and look for other evidence of physics beyond the standard model. So I hope to be able to continue the conversation with you. Um, there are lots of opportunities at Yale for research for sure, but it's a place that also cares about teaching. Thanks.